Thank you, thank you. Good morning, creative mornings. Um, so, as Sam said, um, my name is Adam Walker. Um, my top, our topic today that we are going to explore together is Muse, and I am a creator. And so Sam, Sam came to me and she said, Adam, um, what do you want your topic, to, what do you want your title to be? And I said, well, I'm not really a big fan of boxes, if you could pass those around. Um, I'm not really a big fan of boxes, and I don't like boxing myself in. Um, I want to showcase every element of who I am and the things that I'm passionate about. And so creator just fit that. So I'm not Adam Walker, the architect, or Adam Walker, the construction project manager, or Adam Walker, the minister. I am all of those things. And in all of those spaces, I create. I create buildings. I create um, opportunities within corporate America. I create belief and faith in my ministry work. Um, and so I am a creator. So just a little bit about me. I come from Williamsport, Pennsylvania, small town in central Pennsylvania. We're famous for two weeks every single year um, for the Little League World Series. Um, and so we're on ESPN for two weeks, presidents and famous people. J-Lo was there this year. Um, and so they all come to Williamsport and millions of people come for two weeks and then we fall back um, into nothingness. And so I went to Boston Architectural College, a small niche school of design in Boston that was actually amazing. And while there, I wrote an award-winning thesis on how to overcome marginalization and gentrification through cultural sustainability. Um, I'm currently a construction project engineer for a company called CRB here in St. Louis. Um, my project is in Kentucky. So I spend Monday through Friday in Moorhead, Kentucky and then I come back to St. Louis every weekend. Um, and I'm actually, it's really interesting. Um, so this desk that I have right here holding all of my things, the company that I, I'm building a building for in Moorhead um, makes these whiskey barrels. Um, and then they sell them to the Jack Daniels and Jim Beams of the world. Um, so it's really cool that I get to understand the process of what goes into creating um, this barrel. Um, I'm also, an architectural designer. I, as Sam mentioned, I founded Freedom House Design Group, LLC. We are an architecture, interior design, and construction project management firm that specializes in transformative design um, that begins to design buildings that showcase the inhabitants that will um, live in the buildings. Um, I'm a licensed minister. I work locally at my local church in the youth ministry. I also preach here in, in St. Louis, in Boston, and back home in Pennsylvania. I'm a poet, um, I'm a stage manager. I was the stage manager for seven years in Boston for an international renowned play called The Black Nativity. Um, it was written by famous African-American playwright and poet Langston Hughes, um, and it's been running for 50 years in, in Boston. So, um, and a couple years ago, they made a movie about it with Jennifer Hudson, Forrest Whitaker, and Angela Bassett. Um, so it's kind of a, a really big, amazing um, play. And then I'm also a mentor. Um, and this is just the small list of the things that I do. But um, in my mentorship, one of the things that Sam mentioned as well was the Hip Hop Architecture Camp. Um, and, and I'll highlight that a little bit more later. But the Hip Hop Architecture Camp is a completely free camp for youth that introduces um, youth, um, pr in particular minority youth, to architecture and design um, using hip hop. So I'll, I'll give more detail on that. But um, Michael Ford, uh, architect out of Detroit, founded it. And so, yeah. So what I passed around um, ties into my life philosophy. Um, and my life philosophy is an individual is defined by the collection of characteristics that make them unique. The synergy of these characteristics are what makes them successful. Adam Walker. Yes, I did quote myself. <laughs> I'm that guy. Um, <laughs> but um, I'm very silly. But this, this exploration of, of who I am and, and, and what I believe uh, started when I was in Boston. I was working for a city government and one of the admins came to me and she said, Adam, you need a business card. And, and, and I didn't really like that, that concept of a business card because a business card is small and it locks you into one element of who you are. It says Adam Walker, architect, and that's it. So when you meet me and you engage with me, you walk away knowing Adam Walker, the architect. And I didn't want that to be your experience with me. I wanted you to get a full picture of who I am. So when you walked away, you understood every element of me. So I moved on from that company and I went to work for a 3D printing company. 
And at this 3D printing company, one of my roles was to receive files and print them. So we didn't sell parts, we sold the printers. But in order for me to sell you a half a million dollar printer, I need to be able to show you what it can do. So our clients such as Nike or Disney would send me a file, I would print it, make it look amazing, and then ship it back to them in hopes that they would give me a half a million dollars. Um, one day, a file came across my desk, and it was this flip card. And immediately, it intrigued me and sent me on this eight-month journey of exploration into who I am um, and how I could begin to showcase that. So for eight months, that business card that I just handed to you guys and you, you guys were able to play with, um, I began to explore that, design multiple iterations of it, and I finally landed on that design. And I wasn't trying to be the most creative business card person ever, though I think it's the dopest business card ever, <laughs> humbly. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Um, I wasn't trying to have the most creative business card ever. I was really trying to showcase who I was. So then when you looked at that, you saw Adam Walker, the architect, but you saw the poet, the minister, um, the mentor, um, the things that I believe and the things that I am. And so with that, um, I'm going to pass some things around. Oh, another thing. I'm also a young African-American minister. For those of you who don't know what that means, in the African-American church, when we go to church, the pastor does not get up and stand up there and talk for 30 minutes and you sit quietly and just listen to him and then you get up and leave. In the African-American church, the sermons are definitely a dialogue. So I need you to engage with me and speak back to me. If you want to shout out, ooh, that was fire, or oh, that's so dope, <laughs> feel free. You might distract your neighbor, but you won't distract me, and it's okay. <laughs> Amen. Amen, see, we got already on board, already on board. <laughs> so what is Muse? And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pass some things around. Like I said, this is a dialogue. Just, just pass this around. Um, so, so what is Muse? The dictionary defines Muse as the source that inspires an artist or to have deep thoughts or to meditate. And I feel like that definition is so boring and limiting. Because, because what it does is, is it, it begins to create these boxes for society, right? It puts these artists over here, and then the scientific community over here, and the politicians over here, and it, it limits Muse to just artists. Um, but I would ask that you guys would explore with me how we redefine what Muse is today. Um, so what is that object that I just passed around? Anybody? A, a paper bag, a, a crumpled up paper bag. Exactly. So it's an everyday object, a piece of trash, right? We'll probably throw that in the recycle bin when we're done here today. But for architect Frank Gehry, it became the muse for one of his most iconic buildings. He literally had a crumpled paper bag, threw it on the table, and said, design that. Um, so taking everyday objects, everyday encounters, and allowing them to inspire us to be who we are and what we are to become. What are those? <laughs> I know I'm three years late with that, and my, ch my nieces and nephews will talk about me for using it. It's so corny. Um, but does anybody know what those are? Whoa! I, that's awesome. Um, it's a tow hook. Um, I absolutely did not know what these were when I first encountered them. I had a studio class in architecture school, and my teacher, he was one of those people that if you put him on a game show, he would absolutely win because he had so much random knowledge that made no sense for any human to ever know. And then he also owned a bunch of items that nobody would ever want to own. And so it made me, it made me question three things. It was like, one, why do you have that? Um, two, are you a hoarder? And then three, do we need to stage an intervention and talk to the dean about helping you with this problem of hoarding? But it led to a phenomenal studio class, and he dropped this on my desk, and he said, Adam, you need to design a space based on whatever this object is. And so immediately I had to begin to this journey of discovery of what this item was. Um, and like he said, this is a Mazda tow hook, and it's a very functional item that goes on the back of your car. Um, but for me and my colleague, Russell, it became the basis of the International Car Museum that we designed. Um, and the museum began to showcase um, the history of the car 
and how it can, began to evolve over the time, and then how impactful the car was to society. So everyday encounters, everyday objects that inspire us to be who we are and what we are to become. Does anybody remember these books? So Goosebumps were one of my favorite book series when I was a kid. And um, when I would begin to uh, read these books, there was a certain type of Goosebumps, and it, it was called uh, game books or choose your own adventure books. And what you did is you started at the beginning of the book. And when you started reading it, you read chapter one, you got to the end of chapter one, and then it gave you two options. And it said, if you want to follow Johnny as he explores the cave and goes in and gets half of his body bit off, but then he lives to tell the story, turn to page 139. If you want to go home like Sam would and live out the rest of your days with your family, then turn to page 75. And what it did, there was like 30 different stories inside this book that you got to explore um, and it was this really cool book when I was a kid, and I really loved them. And recently, I was at this poetry event. Um, I was at this poetry event called the Poets in Autumn Tour, and, and there's a group of six spiritual poets, and they go around the world um, doing poetry, and it's, it's really great. And one of the artists, his name is Chris Webb, and Chris Webb got up and he started a poem, and he got to the end of the first segment, and on the screen behind him, so Chris Webb is an amazing visual artist, so his graphics on the screen are not boring like mine. His graphics are actually an interaction with what he's, he's speaking to you. And um, he, he gave you two options, and it, the poem was called Multiple Choice, and you, the audience chose which way he needed to go. Then he went on, and then he got to another place, and he had three options on the screen, and he let the audience choose. And as I was sitting there, I realized he had to memorize 27 different poems in order to give us one production. And it was so mind-blowing to me. And I reached out to Chris on Instagram. I tagged him in my video. And then I reached out to him, and I said, you know, your creativity is just mind-blowing, and it's amazing. Um, and I said, did you ever read one of these Choose Your Own Adventure books when, I was, when you were a kid? Because your poem really reminded me of that. And he said, that was exactly the inspiration for my poem. Um, so he took something that we enjoyed as, as youth, an everyday object, and turned it into one of the most phenomenal poems or creative pieces that I've ever seen. So again, Muse, everyday encounters, everyday objects that challenge us to be who we are and what we are to become. Um, so before I get there, um, what is that that you guys have that I just passed around? Staples and what else? Staples and lyrics. Staples, lyrics, everyday objects, right? How do staples and lyrics relate to each other? Well, for Michael Ford, the hip hop architect, um, they became the inspiration for what he calls pumping up the volume, frozen music. And so the hip hop architecture camp, like I said, is an organization that is free to youth and it goes from city to city. Um, every year it comes to St. Louis and I have the honor of volunteering there every year and we teach youth about architecture using hip-hop and so what Michael came up with was a mathematical equation that converted an artist's lyrics into the built form and they began to build these we teach the youth this equation and the youth build these models to analyze these various artists lyrics so we had Meek Mills, Kanye West, Chance the Rapper, I'm gonna pass this one around um, this is one that I built at the camp this year um, by an artist um, named Toby um, so taking an everyday object that you use every day in a functional capacity and allowing it to be the inspiration to engage with youth and teach them about architecture and hip hop. And so at the end of the camp, one of the things the youth have to do, they learn how to design models and build um, in the 3D environment, but they also learn about the foundations of hip hop. And we have local artists that come out. So Chingy, the rapper, he came out two years ago and played with and, and explored with our youth. And then last year we had a Grammy winning producer come out. And so I'm gonna play you a, a quick clip because at the end of the camp, the kids get to shoot, go into the studio, record their lyrics and shoot a music video. So this is the video, a clip of the video from this year. Don't tell them who 
his mama got a shot, stop the violence And it turned his big brother to a monster Now he about to get a bunch of guns And let it seem like it's a concert We gotta stop it, we are the people It take a process um, so this young man was a kid who won our rap challenge and so he won a pair of Beats headphones and so he also got to be in the music video and it was really cool because we went to the History Museum and we shot part of our video where he's standing right now in the World's Fair exhibit and um, for those of you who don't know what World's Fairs were, they were like this international event that showcased architecture and different foods and design and art um, to the world and one of the most iconic pieces that came out of a World's Fair was the Eiffel Tower. Um, the Eiffel Tower was designed for the Paris World's Fair. Um, also, the Ferris wheel was designed for the Chicago World's Fair as a reaction to the Eiffel Tower. So these World's Fair, Fairs were amazing. They, they, they really set the tone for culture. And so we, we explore with the youth, how do they begin to rap about bettering their communities, designing better communities, and using um, hip hop architecture as their muse? What are those? Quotes, absolutely, they're quotes. But for the slaves, they were underground railroad quotes. And these quotes became maps for them to help them get to freedom. And so each one of these patches um, told a different story to the slave and it would be hung on the line outside of the houses. And so as they came up to this quilt, if it was hung one way, it told them that it wasn't safe to come in and they had to keep going. But if it was hung the opposite way, it told them that they could come in, it was a safe place. And it also each patch told them a different story. Um, for me, these quilts became the foundation and the muse for my thesis project. And I began to explore um, the patches of these quilts and to analyze them and understand what they were actually saying. And it took me on this journey of, of understanding what the flying, flying geese meant and how they communicated and how that communicated to the slaves. And it helped me to design uh, my thesis of the Agora quilted community and how we began to overlap ideas and culture um, to make better communities that aren't gentrified but become very inclusive. And so I, I, I highlighted St. Louis, I highlighted Boston, and I highlighted my hometown, three places that I've lived and three places that I've seen experience the um, negative aspects of gentrification. And so you might say, Adam, well, at the beginning of this talk, you, you said that we were going to explore Muse in a different way, but every, every slide that you've showed me is about artists. And to some degree, it is. There, uh, I've talked about artists. Um, but this, this next project, um, this is the Save-A-Lot headquarters. And um, when I was working at Save-A-Lot, I, I was a construction project manager for them. And one of my major projects was to design and build their brand new headquarters. Um, it was a 150,000 square foot building, um, $25 million. And we did it in about seven months. And, um, it was really challenging, really inspiring, and it was a lot of work. Um, and then we ended up delivering it on time and under budget. And so I was really excited about that, and we moved 500 people in. And when I got done moving everybody in, my boss came to me, he said, Adam, I need you to reconcile your a spreadsheet to meet with the CFO and tell him every dollar spent of your $25 million budget. And I was like, what? I was like, I delivered on time, under budget. What else matters? <laughs> but for three weeks, I had to sit behind a spreadsheet. And spreadsheets, for me, are life draining. I just hate spreadsheets. Um, and it was so boring. And I was sitting there, and I DM'd Mav. Um, so I call her Mav. Her name is Abby. Um, and Abby and I are really close friends. And I sent her a message, and I said, Abby, can you help me with my spreadsheet? Um, and so I was staring at five different spreadsheets on my computer that made no sense to me, and it was the worst thing ever. But Abby came over, and she looked at my screen, and she took these five spreadsheets and turned them into the beautiful, most beautiful spreadsheet I've ever seen. And it completely told the story of what inspired me, a built environment. She told that story through a spreadsheet. Um, so creativity does not just look like the built environment or the artist writing a poem, but what creativity looked like for Abby and what Muse looked like for Abby was taking these spreadsheets and combining them into one. And when I went to the CEO, he, the CFO, he loved me for that spreadsheet. And so it was awesome. Um, so I highlight that to say that in your daily lives, everyday encounters, everyday objects inspiring you to be who you are and what you are to become. 
So again, I ask you, what is Muse? So we will use that definition, everyday encounters, everyday objects, inspiring us to be who we are and what we are to become. And that is our definition, our creative mornings that we explored this morning together and came up with. So what comes next? So if anybody doesn't know who that guy is, um, he is from the musical Hamilton. Um, he's the king in the musical Hamilton, and Hamilton is the most phenomenal musical to ever exist, and I love it. And so he has a song that, that's what, what comes next. Um, and so for me, I really like takeaways. I really like dialogue, like I said. Um, I don't like to just speak for a long period of time. I don't like the sound of my own voice, and I don't want to bore you with it. So how are we taking something away from this discussion? And so I would challenge you to find your own muse. Begin to do an inventory of who you are, the things that you're passionate about. And it might not be what you're doing at work right now. And um, it might not be a nine to five. And I love my nine to five. I love being a construction project manager. Um, but like I said, I also explore every other aspect of who I am in, in speaking and poetry um, and mentoring. And so I would challenge you to begin to explore who you are Find the things in your daily lives that become a muse for you and inspire you to go to higher heights, even in your job. Number two, challenge your circle of influence. We all have family and friends. Um, take this dialogue back to them. Challenge the things that inspire them. Challenge them to become more creative, become um, more engaging, to begin to explore themselves and find the things um, that make them better people and that push them to their passions. And then number three, continuing the dialogue on social media. I would love it if you guys would post um, the question of Muse, our definition of Muse, and have hundreds of comments on your posts um, just exploring this idea of Muse with your um, extended um, social group on social media and then challenging them. And I, I, and I believe that if we, if we begin to do that, if we challenge our circles of influence, if we challenge our social media friends, we will create a world of people that constantly engage in exploring their muse, exploring everyday objects that inspire them to become who they are and what they are to become. So muse, thank you. <laughs>